Well, welcome everybody. I'm not sure if I should say Happy Thanksgiving or Merry Christmas, because technically we're kind of in the middle, right? It's still Thanksgiving weekend, but it's the first Sunday of Advent, so we're kind of in this land in between. And so we're going to kind of balance that today and talk a little bit about uh, gratitude of, of, of Thanksgiving as well as the meaning of Christmas uh, as well. I want to start by just saying that there are three words that can be very, very powerful, right? Sometimes just three words is all it takes. I love you can transform the dynamic of a relationship from where just dating to we're going to another level, right? Just those three words, all it takes sometimes. Three words strung together like I was wrong, I am sorry, please forgive me, can change the dynamic of a relationship, right? You're, you're in the midst of a fight, hurting each other, and somebody speaks those three words in succession or those series of three words, and all of a sudden, we're not fighting anymore, we're not hurting anymore, now we're trying to mend, and now we're trying to grow together in a different kind of way. Three words, three words like the refs, stink. Now that doesn't change anything, but it makes you feel better about your team losing, doesn't it? Sometimes, you know, just blame it on the referees. Our team couldn't be that bad. Well, over the past few days, we've celebrated Thanksgiving and three words have been in my mind. They have the power, I believe, to change your life and not only change your life, but give you a, a better feeling about your own heart and life. But these words, more than just, when it, more than just making you feel better, when lived out, I think they bring joy to the heart of Christ. And our lives are not just about me feeling good and me doing better, you're at church. It's a place where we acknowledge that we're here for God. He's not here for us only, we're here for him. And whenever you live out these three words we're gonna talk about today, somehow something happens to the heart of God and it changes the dynamic of your relationship with him forever. It takes it to a new depth. Now, now here's the first of those three words. The first word is gratitude. Now I know what some of y'all are thinking. Gratitude, that's not very creative. I know it's a holiday weekend. You need to lower your expectations for this sermon right now, okay? So, so gratitude is just the first word that we're gonna talk about. This idea of, of God making you to be grateful, a grateful heart, give thanks to God for all you have. The Bible talks a lot about gratitude. Do you think God wants you to be grateful? What do you think? Think he does? I think he wants you to be grateful. I say that because in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, there was this, this offering called a thank offering that the Israelites were required to give. And that thank offering would not only be an aroma to God, a pleasing aroma to God, but there was also a benefit for the one who offered the thank offering. It led to a celebration and a feast. God wanted his children to give thanks. The psalmist says in Psalm 100 verse four, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness endures to all generation. You're giving thanks to God for his character and who he is. If you're facing an impossibility and you need a miracle, Jesus taught us to start the prayer by giving thanks. Before he fed 5,000 people, Jesus blessed the food and thanked God for it. Before he called Lazarus out of the tomb, Jesus said, God, I thank you that you hear me. There's gratitude that can increase our worship, which increases our faith for a miracle. The Bible tells us in every day, in everything, give thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God wants you to grow in gratitude. It's his desire. He wants this. Now, typically this time of year, you see a picture uh, like this that, that circulates. Y'all seen this picture circulating around a little bit? It's a picture of an old man giving thanks for bread and soup, and he's got a Bible. That, that picture will circulate a good bit. It's actually a picture that was staged in 1918. The guy who took the picture asked this guy, who's a peddler uh, selling his wares, he asked him to pose for the picture with just the bread and the soup and the Bible because the photographer wanted to give to the people of his day who were in the midst of a world war, going without so much, he wanted them to see there's still so much for which to give thanks. And so that's what that picture it's supposed to remind us of. Maybe today you feel like there's so much that you don't have, but there's so much for which you can still give thanks. 
On Thanksgiving Day, my daughter Mackenzie uh, asked us as a family to uh, do a Thanksgiving Day exercise where we each were given a piece of paper and then we had to write down five things that we were thankful for. Any of y'all do something like this? We had to write it all down. Um, well, y'all should have a daughter like Mackenzie then. And maybe she could help y'all to do that kind of stuff. But, but we all had to write it down. And then we had to go around. And if you felt comfortable, you could share just one thing on your list. But it couldn't be, you know, I'm thankful for my family or, you know, my marriage or whatever like that. It had to be something that you're thankful for. My mother-in-law, who's 81, said I'm thankful for my health. Now you think about it, at 81 years old, she still drives all over the place. She has a job, she works, she gardens, she does her own thing. It's amazing that she does what she does at 81 without skipping a beat, man. She's thankful for that. My wife, Christy, said, I'm thankful for water. Christy has been to Haiti and she's seen how some people live in abject poverty and just a glass of water, a clean glass of water, is, it's unheard of there. And, and yet you and I, we run our showers and bathtubs for minutes before we even think about going in there. We'll turn the sink on and just let it run so the water gets hot. And she just said, I'm thankful thankful for water. When was the last time you were just thankful for clean water? Another member of our family said, I'm thankful for sobriety. Without it, I had nothing. We got a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Your, your, your list may be different from that list, but we have so much to be thankful for. I've been reflecting on what is it that I have to be thankful for, and certainly there are so many material things, but, but there are also some spiritual things for which I give thanks today. I give thanks for grace, for God's grace, and I say that because I'm reading the book of Hosea. Have y'all ever read the book of Hosea? Are you familiar with this book in the Old Testament? Hosea is a prophet in the Old Testament. He is prophesying to the nation of Israel who is totally running from God, and God makes Hosea's life a, a word picture, a living sermon for the people of Israel. God tells Hosea to go marry a woman named Gomer who is a prostitute, and so he does. And they get married and Gomer is unfaithful to him, shocker. She's unfaithful to him and goes back to her old life and God says to Hosea, go buy her back and bring her home. And he does. He loves this woman and he is faithful to her though she is unfaithful to him. And through Hosea the prophet, God says to the children of Israel, you guys are like Gomer, this, this unfaithful wife, you've chased everything but me, but I am like Hosea. The more you run, the more I run after you. And I'm not letting you go. I don't know if you remember singing a song whenever you were in the church you grew up in. We'll sing it sometimes around here too. This lyric that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Come on, anybody in here besides me identify with that? Sing that song and just remember, man, God is so good and we run so much and yet he never stops chasing you. Thank God for grace. Hosea 6.1 says, come, let's return to the Lord. He's torn us, but he'll heal us. He's wounded us, but he'll bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Hosea is saying to Israel, yes, you've made a mess, and yes, there are some consequences, but God's graciously restoring and healing and reviving you to life. Thank God today for grace in your life. I thank God for righteousness. Thank God for righteousness in my life. Um, I, I'm reading in the New Testament in Matthew 22 this story that uh, is really kind of shocking. It's a shocking story in Matthew 22. Jesus is talking and he says to the people listening to him, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who throws a wedding banquet for his son. The king throws a wedding banquet for his son and he sends out invitations and everybody RSVPs and says, we'll be there. But when it comes time, to, everything's set, everything's in place, food is ready, everything's set. He says to everybody, okay, now come to the banquet and yet those people who said they would come, they won't show up. One's got to go to the farm for the weekend. I'm sure it was opening day of deer season. Another one said they got to go to work. I'm sure they were behind in business and, and just needed to catch up. Other people were, you know, they just had other things to do. They were mean to the messengers. And the king is livid. The king actually sends his army to those people's houses, kills them, burns their cities, then says to his servants, go into the highways and the hedges and invite anybody who can come. Invite them to come into my house. 
And so they do. And that banquet hall is filled with people. And then the king, the Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 11, it says, the king came in to look over the dinner guests. And he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how'd you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, does that story freak anybody out besides me? I mean, like that is, that's a hard story, but Jesus told it. He told it. it we got to live, we got to do something with that. What is this story that he's saying? He's saying God is gracious. His son is going to get married. Revelation 20, 21. Come on, we're going to the wedding of the, of, the, of the son of God. And he's telling us, get ready. And it's not just you saying I'm ready. It's are you dressed and ready and showing up at the, at the banquet hall ready. Now, here's what my Bible study, my, my study Bible says about this idea of being dressed. This person who showed up at the king's banquet hall and wasn't dressed in their culture first century, whenever you showed up to a wedding, they would give you the clothes to wear so that everybody looked festive and, and looked, you know, like they were ready and, and, and on, the, on the team. Kind of like y'all ever seen, uh, you know, family reunions and everybody's got the same t-shirt on. Come on, y'all ever seen elementary school classes going on a field trip and everybody's got the same color, you know, deal on, right? So, so you're saying I'm in with, with what's going on. I'm a part of the celebration. For a person to refuse to wear the, the robe, the garment given was to say to the uh, people throwing the party, I don't wanna take part. I'm too good for that. I don't need that. And so here's what my study Bible says this story's trying to tell you. That when it comes to getting into God's banquet his kingdom banquet you got to be dressed appropriately and the appropriate dress is the righteousness of God now please watch this please pay attention because a lot of us are telling God yeah God I want to come to that banquet I want to go to heaven I want to be a part of your family but you have never trusted in Jesus to clothe you you're trying to clothe yourself you're saying to God you want to be there but you're kind of doing your own thing and so the idea is that God tells us, I want you to stop trying to be good, stop trying to dress yourself up, tr stop trying to, to, to be good enough for me and let me clothe you. Here's what Isaiah 61 verse 10 says. Isaiah 61 10 says this. I will re rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with robes of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Isaiah is saying, God dresses me. He's the one that makes me ready for that banquet. So let me just stop and ask you. When it comes to you standing before God, how do you see yourself dressed? All right? So think with me. You're standing before God. Don't, don't think about anybody but you and God right now. You're standing before God. How are you dressed? Because for some of you, if you're trying to be dressed in your righteous good deeds that you've done, Isaiah also says your best day is filthy rags compared to the holiness of God. Y'all remember that scripture? So if you're trying to be good enough, pay enough money, serve enough, memorize the Bible enough, you're, you're, you're not getting in. Others of you, you go the other way and it's not your righteous good deeds that you see yourself dressed in. You see yourself clothed in guilt and shame and condemnation, failure, because your life is such a visible, obvious wreck to you and you think God would never let me stand in front of him. Can I say to both groups, you need to not see yourself that way, but see yourself the way God is inviting you to see yourself, and that is by faith to receive the righteousness of Jesus. That Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, that he was righteous, you weren't, he was. And when you trust in what he's done for you, the Bible says he puts his righteousness now on you, and you stand before God, not because you're good, but because Jesus is good. His righteousness now covers you. The apostle Paul struggled with this. He was a very religious man, so religious that he killed people. 
And he finally recognized and realized that in his ambition, selfishly, he was doing more harm than good. And he finally had to quit trying to be good and just trust in Jesus. And this is what he says in Philippians 3, verse 9. He says, ultimately, I wanted to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so I just wonder, this Thanksgiving weekend, have you stopped to just say, God, thank you that you dress me in your righteousness. Now, that may sound very churchy, but you're in church on Thanksgiving. Stop and say to God, thank you for what you've done for me. We we sang that song a minute ago, Christ Alone, a cornerstone. And it really is a hymn, an old hymn we used to sing the verses are, and then we kind of break into uh, Christ alone. But we left out the last verse of the hymn that that song has come from. The last stanza of that hymn says, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, and faultless stand before the throne. Can I just say, we need to give thanks to God for his goodness to cover us with his righteousness. And thank God for hope. Jesus is coming, and and that's going to change everything. He comes to you in the lowest of your lows. Hosea 6 verse 3 says, so let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn. Do you see that? God wants you to know that his going forth is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. What is he saying? He's saying you can't stop God from coming, from coming to you or from coming. I wrote in the margin of my Bible when I read that this week, I wrote in the margin of my Bible, I can't stop him from coming after me. You can, you can no more stop God from coming after you than you can stop the sun from coming up tomorrow. Try it. Go out into your driveway. Go out into the middle of the field or the reservoir and just yell at the sky, stop, son. Don't come up. I rebuke you. I, re- I refuse for you to come up. Yell at the sky. Cuss at it. Re- say you don't have faith in God. But the sun's going to come up, hoss. Come on, anybody agree with that? You agree with that? Sun's coming up tomorrow. You can no more stop God from coming to you than you can stop that sun from coming up. And he's coming again and again for us. And one day he comes for all of us. And that gives me hope. I'm also reading Matthew 22. Thank God for Matthew 25. Where he says this, Matthew 25, 31, when the son of man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And I just meditated on that verse this week. It's almost Christmas. The first time Jesus came, he came very humbly. And there were a couple of angels who announced his birth to some shepherds. But when he comes again, and he will come again, He's coming not in humility, but he's coming in glory. Can you just, if you need to close your eyes to envision it, can you envision it? He's coming in glory and all the angels with him. What must the sky look like when he comes like that? What radiance, what power, what faith becoming sight for us? What shout would rise up from the people of God when Jesus comes and he sits on the throne in all of his glory. I don't know about you, but in the midst of a world that is broken and a life that is broken, it makes me want to say to God, come on now. There's hope. So if we have gratitude in our heart, let's be grateful. Let's bless God. Let's tell him that, not just the attitude, but let's say to God, thank you. I was thinking about my son Reagan and I. We went to Kansas a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and once again, he had a great hunt and, and killed a huge deer. And Reagan is one of the most disciplined, patient hunters. I, I know he will sit through sleet or heat. He will sit through snow, wind, or rain. Doesn't matter. He will sit right there, and he's just got a lot of favor on him when it comes to that. And he had a good hunt. Once I dropped him off so that he could fly back to college, I'm driving home. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm not 
stealing any shade off of Reagan. Reagan did that. But I'm thinking, you know, without me, he wouldn't have got to do all that. I mean, think about it. Who taught him how to hunt? Who bought him his bow, gives him his arrows, gives him all of his clothes, pays for the lease, pays for the corn, finds the spot, tells him where to go? Who does all that? Papa. <laughs> right? Papa. Now, now he, did, he did the actual hunt, but there was a lot that went into it so that he could actually do his part. And as I was driving home somewhere on some interstate, just meditating, thinking, talking to God, it was as if God said in Chip, that's the way your life is with me. You can talk about what you do and how you do and what's happened and where you've been or whatever, but none of that happens without God being a good father to me. You with me? Okay, so I'm saying to you, I'm saying to you right now, that it may be tempting for you to think, well, I've done this, but I went to school, but I got an education, but I risked, but I did this and I did that. Yes, you did. But apart from God, you have nothing. We got, we got to say with John the Baptist in, in John 3, verse 27, it says, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Your ability to walk, see, hear, play, think, all comes from God. It's a gift. God, we say, thank you. Now, if Reagan really wants to say, thank you to me, what does he do? Well, he can speak it to me. Dad, thank you. He can tell other people, man, my dad blessed me. He can enjoy it even whenever nothing's happening, not complain about, oh my gosh, I can't believe you put me in such a bad place. He could not do that and just say, you know, the sun was so beautiful coming up or going down and the birds or the whatever. He could enjoy it. He could live a life of gratitude. He could answer my calls whenever I call him. If I ask him to do something, he would actually do it occasionally. He might even let me, you know, shoot a deer myself. We hadn't got that far yet, but we're working on it, right? So he could do those things. How could you give thanks to God? By speaking it and saying to God today, God, I just want to stop and say thank you. And whenever you come into contact with other people this week, just keep saying, you know, God's been so good to me. Man, we had a blessed time, been so blessed by God. You just speak it out. You enjoy God's blessing. You don't complain about what you don't have. You say, God, thank you for all that you have given me. And you find a way to give thanks in the midst of it. And then you live it out. When God comes to you and says, hey, I want to talk, you say, yes, let's talk. When God makes a request of you, you say, yes, God, my yes is on the table. That's a grateful life. So y'all with me? I'm not just talking about being grateful in your head. I'm saying let's be grateful with our lives. Gratitude is the first word. Here's the second word. Second word is contentment. Second word is contentment. Okay, I know Austin taught on contentment a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not going to belabor it, but, but it is a word that's on my heart. Gratitude means, God, I'm thankful. Content means I'm satisfied. I'm good. I got enough. That's a real fight to be grateful. It's an even bigger fight to find contentment in your life. Why? Because Proverbs 27 says the eyes of a man are never satisfied. You can always see something more that you want. There's always another advertisement. There's always somebody else with a nicer this or a nicer that or a better life or a better whatever. And our, our lives can all of a sudden become some relentless pursuit of the next thing to make you happy. My nephew, Caleb Hughes, is a pastor over in um, Meridian and he tweeted a tweet this week that I couldn't really understand. He was using really big words, but I think this is what he was trying to say. He's trying to make a contrast between the most thankful day of the year, Thanksgiving, Thursday. Be grateful for God's goodness. And the very next day, the most greedy, accumulating day of the year, Black Friday, where we shop till we drop. And he's talking about the whiplash that that must have on our souls to be grateful and then go get everything you can before anybody else gets it. We, we got to fight to stay grateful and fight to stay contented. God wants you to be content. He wants you to be content with what you have. John the Baptist had some soldiers coming to him saying, man, what do we need to do? John the Baptist is telling people how they need to be, be, live their lives. What do we need to do? And he says, stop robbing people. Stop using your position to flex on people and steal from them. He said in Luke 3, 14, be content with your wages. Don't steal and don't cheat to get ahead. Be content. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 8, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Now covering, he's talking about house, clothes, 
food. Those are basic things. If you're looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is on the bottom shelf, right? This is as basic as it gets. So I want to ask you, do you really need any more food right now? No, no, some of y'all could fast for a couple weeks after what we just got through going through, couldn't we? I mean, we eat so much, we're tired of it while we, while we make another plate. Do you really need more clothes right now? Well, you actually might because you ate too much. So you might not fit into your old clothes, have to go get some new clothes. But for the most part, we have closets and drawers and, and attic spaces filled with clothes that we almost never wear. But we keep it just in case. Paul says, what are we doing? Shopping for more. Be content, he says. Hebrews 13, 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself said, I'll never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. The writer of Hebrews is trying to say to you, when it comes to stuff, believe that God's enough. And so here's where contentment really begins to grow. It begins to grow when you say, God, I trust you. That you know what I need and you'll make sure I get it when I need it. Content with what you have content when life is hard. God wants you to be content when life is hard. There's a guy in the Bible named Paul, and he suffered from a thorn in the flesh. Any of y'all ever heard of Paul and his thorn in the flesh? Any of y'all remember that story? It, it, it's, it, we don't know what his thorn was exactly. People speculate on it, but whatever it was, it was painful, and it was prolonged, and he wanted it gone. He's suffering with this thorn in the flesh. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, concerning this, Paul says, I implored, I begged God three times that it might leave me. And I don't mean, I don't think that means three different prayers. I think it means three different seasons of his life when he was especially oppressed, especially weighed down, maybe for days, weeks, or months even, he's begging God, take it away, and yet the weight of it, the pain of it persists. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. He, he doesn't take the pain away. God adds his grace. For power is perfected in weakness. Now check out Paul's attitude. Most gladly, therefore, in the midst of pain, he's saying, I have gladness, I have joy. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me, therefore I'm well content. Even with my weakness, with insults, with distresses and persecution, with difficulties, I think that may be hinting at what his thorn was. All these for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. Paul said, please, please feel this with me. Paul said, I feel this pain and it is real and it is bad but I am good even in the middle of it because Jesus meets me and he's more than enough. He's my peace, he's my strength, he's my confidence, and in the craziest way, he actually gives me gladness. Who am I talking to? Who right now is the Spirit of the Lord trying to say to you, you feel like you got a thorn in the flesh and you've been begging God to take it away too, you want relief so bad? And maybe God is saying to you today, child, I may not take it, take it away, but I want to add to you my grace. And by my spirit within you, I'll be your peace. I'll be your strength. I'll be your help. I'll be your joy. Trust me. God says, trust me when life is hard. Austin taught us a couple of weeks ago about contentment. He said, your eyes on Jesus, eyes on heaven, and be thankful. And so right now, in the midst of the pain, thank Jesus. He is with you. He is good, and he is worth whatever it is that's happening in you is more important and better than whatever is happening around you or to you. So be thankful, be content when life is hard, and be content in every circumstance. Here's what Paul tried to teach the first century believers, what he's trying to say to you and me today, that if you think contentment's gonna happen from the outside in, that if you finally get enough money, nobody's mad at you, you got the right people around you, you have enough stuff, whew, peace. It'll never happen, because your eyes will never be satisfied. He says instead, contentment happens from the inside out. You gotta learn contentment in your heart, and then you can have contentment no matter what you do or don't have around you. 
Now this, this, is, this comes straight out of the book of Philippians where Paul is writing to the church of Philippi and he's thanking them for giving an offering to him while he's in prison. All right, so, so track with me. He's in prison and yet he's like receiving one of our Pine Lake care packages as a prisoner. And he's writing a thank you note back to the church that gave him the care package saying thank you for thinking about me. And this is what he writes, this is what he writes. He says, Philippians 4, 11, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content. Everybody say learned, say it. You see it? I've learned to be content. It didn't just happen to me. It's a process. It's a journey. It's a deliberate thing that I'm pursuing. I've learned that the Greek word is actually mathetes. What we talked about a couple of, last week, this idea of learning as a follower. I learned it over time with effort. I learned to be content in whatever circumstance that I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, here it is again, I've learned the secret of being filled, going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now please, know the context of the promise of I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It doesn't mean that you can win a game or make a shot or do those things. Claim it if you need to, but the context is, no matter how good or bad life is, Jesus will always be enough. He's always enough. So if all you have is a little, he'll be enough. It's part of my personal journey of self-discovery and figuring out my life and different things. I'm reading back over some of my old journals. Um, I've journaled about my spiritual journey and my life since the um, 1990s. Okay, so for like you guys, y'all like, you were born in the 1900s, Chip? Yes, I was born in the 1900s, I'm that old. And I was, uh, I'm reading about my life in 1991. And Christy and I were uh, pastoring a church in Tangipahoa, Louisiana, 22 members. And uh, I wrote on December the 31st, 1991, that, Tangipahoa Baptist Church gave me and Christy a Christmas gift of $235. And I write, we were shocked to say the least. Like the saying goes, his shovel is bigger than ours. Here's what I was trying to say. That's a lot of money. Now, I don't know if $235 represents a lot of money for you where you are, but in 1991 in Tangipahoa, Louisiana for two kids who didn't know what they were doing, That was like a million bucks. And I know what it means to have nothing and yet know that God can still provide. He's enough. He's enough. He'll see you through. Trust him. He'll see you through. But even if you have an abundance, please know your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Know that those possessions are going to be fleeting. They're going to leave you at some point. And so what you need to do is enjoy it while you got it and bless as many people as you can with it. That's what Paul's saying. I know the, 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 the key to contentment, whether I got a lot or little, is Christ is enough for me. I read a Uh, an article this week by Joshua Edson called Contentment Breeds Generosity. This is what he says. The purpose of contentment in Christ's sufficiency isn't that we have less stress. So please hear it. Because what you've been thinking this whole time is if I have contentment, I'll have peace. But what if that's not the goal? What if you're not the goal of contentment at all? What if... Contentment is really about putting our faith into action, becoming instruments of God's blessing and provision to others. A natural outgrowth of contentment is generosity. Once we really know and trust in our hearts that Christ cares enough to provide for all of our needs, it unshackles our hands and our hearts so we can freely share with other people God's blessing. So yes, have gratitude and have contentment that does give you peace, but it leads me to my third word, which is generosity. I'm convinced that you can't have contentment unless you have, gener- unless you have gratitude. But once you're grateful, you can be content with what you have and contentment then leads to 
a generous life. You've been blessed by God, right? We're in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Thanksgiving, gratitude. Christmas, God, you've been so generous to us. And so now I want my life to be generous to others. There's a scripture in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Paul writes to young Timothy and he says, I want you to instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. Don't think that your money makes you something, that you got it on your own. Don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. The result being they store up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life Indeed, I think this scripture ties all three words together. Gratitude, you didn't get this, God did this for you. Contentment, God wants to meet your needs and let you enjoy some. Have rest, trust him, but also gratitude. Be generous and ready to share. You see, God gives you money, I believe, for three reasons. To meet your needs, to let you enjoy, but also for you to share with other people, to help them. So as we transition from Thanksgiving to Christmas, I want to challenge you to be grateful and generous. Okay, so Pine Lake family, listen to me. I want your kids to get Christmas presents. All right, all the little kids should say amen to that, right? I'm not saying that you and your family and friends shouldn't exchange Christmas presents. That's a good thing. We're reminded that God gave to us on Christmas. Thank him. That's why we're giving. We're reminding ourselves that God is a generous God and he's blessed us and so we give gifts. I am asking you to lift your eyes off of just yourself and your family to other people in need. All right, so you hear what I'm asking you to do. I'm not saying don't have Christmas at your house. I'm saying have Christmas at your house. But is there a way for you as an individual, a couple, a family to say, who else could we bless who maybe doesn't have? And maybe that giving starts with your church. You can always give to your church. There are always a variety of needs and people that we will help. But I would say to you, look in your family. Maybe there's somebody in your family that is having a hard time in a rough spot. Maybe you'd have to give, them, give this to them anonymously, but find a way to help. Paul talks about taking care of your family. Now, don't give them so much that it's going to ruin them, right? You don't want to give cash to a person who's struggling with an addiction necessarily. But you, you get the idea. Is there somebody that we could help? And, and look beyond your family. Maybe there are just ministries or people in need. There's Salvation Army. There's Gateway. There's Mission First. There's We Will Go. There's, I mean, a thousand different ministries, probably literally in Jackson, Mississippi, that you could say, you know what? We're going to give or we're going to go serve or support maybe you would sponsor a child through Compassion International from Columbia as a part of what we're doing. But is there a way for you this Christmas to say, rather than us consuming it all on ourselves, we want to be generous to somebody else? I think it's right. I just think it's the right thing to do because generosity imitates Jesus. Christmas is our celebration that Jesus came for us and gave to us generously, lavishly. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. What's Paul saying? He's saying that Jesus was in heaven, had everything he needed, but he saw you in need. And so he gave of himself all the way to the point of poverty so that you could have your deepest need met righteousness, grace, hope. Thank you. So if God is generous like that, he's calling you and me now. Be generous. That imitates the heart of God. Your generosity has impact on people's lives. We tell you that all the time. Try to at least that as you give, you bless thousands of students and kids and college students and ministries and missionaries around the world. But it also opens you up to God's economic plan for sowing and reaping, but here's what I want you to hear today. That whenever you're generous, God's not just doing something through you, God's not just doing something for you, something happens inside of you. Something happens inside your heart, something happens in a person's heart, Christian or non-Christian, something happens in your heart whenever you are generous. I, 
I read this week an article by Joshua Becker called The Collision of Contentment and Generosity, and he points out the impact that generosity has on your own heart and life. Not that you're blessing other people, but that whenever you give, something happens to you. He says the foundation for a generous life is certainly a contented heart. I've got contentment, now I can be generous. But he says, but the opposite can also be true. The more you give, the more you might begin to experience contentment. He points out that studies show that generous people are generally happier, healthier, and more satisfied with life. Generous people have more fulfilling relationships because people like to be around somebody who's thinking about other people. And generous people, he points out, have less desire for more. They found fulfillment and meaning and value in relationship outside the acquisition of more possession. They've learned to find joy in what they already possess and then give away the rest. You see, what this guy's saying is what Jesus had already told us. Acts 20 verse 35 says this. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That as you move from gratitude and contentment to generosity, something's going to happen in your heart. You become more like Christ. Something begins to stir within you. You begin to have more fulfillment, more peace, more joy, more happiness. And as you're generous, you're investing in eternity. You're investing in a life beyond what we see. It's so counterculture. But we started 2022. The first sermon I gave you on January of 2022 was about living in an alternate reality. That yes, we live in this world that is flawed and under a curse. And so God sent Jesus, his son, to introduce an alternate reality, a kingdom reality. And so God calls you and me to live in this alternate reality. The people of the world do not get it. They cannot get it. Only Christ can reveal it to you. But once you have it, once you're dressed in his righteousness, you have his spirit eyes to see. Now I'm living for a different kingdom. And somehow as we give, as we live, our living and giving lays up a foundation for us for the future in a different realm. I don't understand how it works, but I just know Jesus taught that. In Luke chapter 16, verse 9, it says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, and it will fail, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. God says, Jesus says, use your money to bless people, because somehow heaven hears and sees and records. I think that's what Paul was trying to say to Timothy to say to the church of his day, instruct those who are rich, don't be conceited, don't put your hope in your wealth, put your hope in God. Thank God who gave you everything to enjoy a little bit, but instruct them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and be ready to share, be generous and ready to share because that's when you lay hold of that, which is life indeed. So what do you say? Three little words, very powerful, could change your life if you not only believe them, but begin to live them. Gratitude. Contentment. Generosity. Could you pray them with me right now? Come on, just across the room, online right now. Just close your eyes and maybe bow your head if that helps. It's a posture of humility. You don't have to do that. You can look up if you want to. It doesn't matter. You can open your hands. But would you open your heart? Would you talk to God right now just with a heart of gratitude. Come on, can you give God thanks for his many blessings? Thank God for grace and righteousness and hope. Could you pray about contentment just for a second? God, you've been good and you're enough. 
regardless of your circumstances, regardless of what you're going through, what you do or don't have, God, you're enough for me. I trust you. What you're doing in me is more important than what you're doing around me. Would you pray the word generosity for a moment? And maybe it means you're just listening. Who or how would God have you be generous in these next four or five weeks? What would that look like for you? Your gift may be small to somebody, but Jesus sees it. Everybody can give something. You can bless somebody. Because that's what Jesus does. Three words with a lot of power to say to God, can I give you three more? I love you. Come on, would you pray that right now? Could you say that to God? God, I love you. I need you to teach me how to do it more, but God, I, I want you to know I love you. God, you love me. I receive that love right now. God, I've been wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Would you let those words change the dynamic of your relationship with God right now? I've been wrong, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I trust you. Come change me. In just a second, I'm gonna close our time with, with a prayer and we're gonna stand up and sing a song that's just about gratitude. I'm gonna have some friends around the room who'd love to pray with you, help you speak life over you if you need that today. But would you just let your worship to the Lord rise up from your heart. Lord, we love you and we bless you. We thank you for loving us first. God, our hearts are filled with gratitude for all your goodness. Lord, you're more than enough for us. Teach us, God, teach us contentment and rest. And Father, would you open our hands and our hearts to be generous, lavish with our goods, with our gifts, and with the gospel to share with the world in need. Lord, we love you. We bless you. All glory to God. All glory and praise be to your name. In Christ's name, amen.